Hey everyone, this is a screencast that I'm doing where I'm re redoing my talk from a recent conference where I did my first conference talk. It was jQuery TO and I did that on the weekend of March 2nd and 3rd. And yeah, I just thought I'd redo it here. Uh, if you've been following my blog and you're pretty experienced with CSS, then you probably won't find too much in here that's new. Um, but you know, I was hoping it being maybe a more of a programming audience at the conference that uh, maybe not as many people were familiar with CSS. Uh, so I went over a bunch of stuff in CSS, in particular with regards to CSS animations and transitions. So the title of the talk is "When jQuery and CSS3 Collide." So a lot of you know me already. I write on impressive webs. I've helped to co-authored this book on HTML5 and CSS3. I've also helped with a couple of other books, uh, the review process of these two CSS books. I've also written numerous articles for various websites and uh, built a couple of tools uh, related to CSS. So uh, just from all of that uh, and from those of you who know me, you know that I'm kind of more of a CSS guy. So speaking at a jQuery conference in front of uh, some probably some really smart people, I felt like this. So I hope I was still able to provide uh, the uh, those in the audience with some things to think about in regards to CSS and how it relates to how we uh, kind of write our jQuery and our CSS together. So no matter what tools we're using on the front end, uh, we always have the goal of wanting them to work well together. So we can kind of compare it to this baked potato. We all like a baked potato with sour cream and chives, but what if I offered you just a baked potato with nothing on it, or just a big tub of sour cream, or only this big pile of chives? Well, I don't think any of us would want any one of those things, but you put those three things together, and now you have something delicious, something beautiful. So I think the same can be applied to the tools that we use. We want to do everything we can to make them work well together. So the two technologies that I'll be focusing on in this talk is uh, jQuery and CSS. So two concepts that you can take away from this would be Number one, think modular and learn the subtleties of the tools that we're using. So let's take, first of all, a look at the that first concept there, thinking modular. So customarily in jQuery, and you'll see in this presentation, I'm, I'm focusing a lot on animation and transitions. So customarily in jQuery, we've done animations using either the animate method or one of these built-in methods, uh, fade in, slide up, etc. So here's how a uh, an animation might look with uh, the animate method where we're changing some CSS there on the fly. So we see it in response to that event, we run uh, the animate method and then we decide which CSS properties we want to change and how much the duration is going to be. In this case, it's three seconds or 3,000 milliseconds. We might also do something like this. This is very simple theoretical code, but it kind of demonstrates how we've done this kind of thing in the past. We might use these built-in jQuery methods where we fade something out or slide something down. But I'm here to say that maybe this is unnecessary. Mixing our CSS, especially in this case where we're using the animate method, mixing our CSS with our jQuery logic. And especially is this unnecessary where we're actually uh, changing the CSS on the fly using the CSS method. So this is not using animation but we're just changing for example the height using jQuery's CSS method. So I think all of that's unnecessary. So the alternative is to use classes. So we have the exact same thing happening same thing happening here where we have the event and in response to the event we don't animate the box directly with JavaScript or jQuery but instead we add a class called animate box and then in our CSS we have our animate box class defined. So here again, we're changing the, we're doing the exact same thing we did with the jQuery code, the animate method that we that I showed you a couple of slides ago, 
changing the height and width, and we're doing it over a duration of three seconds, and we're doing this with specifically with a CSS transition. So when we're switching over to CSS for this type of thing, we might think of, well, okay, what well, one of the benefits we had of using the animate method was the fact that we could call a function when the animation completed. We can't really do that with pure CSS. So we can do that, however, with the transition end event. So in that case, we're using a transition and we can actually do the same kind of thing by calling the transition end event or looking for the transition end event on the particular element. So here we can see some theoretical code where we're toggling the class animate box and then when that toggles we know the box is going to animate and in this case we're using jQuery's one method to attach that to the box element and we're looking for the transition end event and then we have a callback function that runs when that event is fired. So we know when the transition ends, now we fire this amount of code. And we're using the one event here because we only want the event to uh, be triggered just the one time. And we want that code to run only once. Because we're transitioning two different properties, the event will actually fire twice. But we're actually doing it once. Now if you're do using different transitions with different timing on the same element, then you'll have to figure out how you want to, how you best want to do that maybe by counting or something like that and then when you get to the last event that's might, might be where you want to run the actual code and if you're going to be doing that sort of thing then I recommend using modernizers prefixed feature here you can see some code code in lines 1 to 9 uh, let the browser figure out or let modernizer figure out which of the trans transition end event uh, syntaxes to use depending on what browser is being used and then you can just throw that variable that you see on ver on line 9 trans and event name just throw that into your code wherever you want to uh, look for that event name or throw in that event name so that way you're not repeating yourself unnecessarily like we were here uh, with all of this code with all the different uh, vendor prefixes <clears throat> so you can get more information on transition end on MDN and you can do the exact same thing with animation end. So if you're doing CSS animations using the at keyframes at rules, you can detect the end of an animation uh, the same way using here the animation end event. So we have the different vendor prefixes mentioned or included there in the one method. And again, you can use modernizer prefix to get the right one depending on which browser the user is using. So that way you're not repeating the code. And of course, more info on animation and on MDN. And it should be noted here that a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about with regards to animations and the API and whatnot uh, will eventually kind of be universally solved in this new spec that's under development right now, Web Animations 1.0. So if you want to kind of look at what's the future of uh, CSS animation and kind of, which is kind of supposed to be uh, combining. A CSS, JavaScript, and SVG-based animations all into one specification. So it'll be much easier to use. So there's a slide presentation on that that you might want to check out. Uh, I'll, I'll have a link to it here on the page. And knowing now that we're using animations and kind of separating our CSS uh, from our JavaScript logic, uh, I just thought I'd show you this other uh, kind of design pattern that I came across Paul Irish actually showed me this link. <clears throat> it's called Classy HTML, Speculative Design Pattern about Classes and Composition by a developer named Michael Mahimov. So he talks about defining app states. So I'll just show you what he kind of goes over in his post there. And I highly recommend you check that out. Again, I'll have links to everything here on the page where the screencast appears or in the description if you're looking at this on YouTube or something. Uh, so he talks about uh, defining app states by changing the class on the HTML element. So here we have, uh, 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 he gives an example of a, a countdown app. So when the, when the app is fresh, the HTML element has a class of fresh. And then once it starts counting, that, then using JavaScript, we change the class name to counting. And then when it's done, we change the class name to done. 
and then we might go back to counting again. But then we would only go back to fresh when the user restarts uh, a session on the app. So that's just a, a simple example of how we'd be defining app states. So we're hooking onto the HTML element there, changing the class name, and we could technically use whatever root component we want in our application. It doesn't necessarily have to be the HTML element. But then in our CSS, we would have something like this, where we're styling the same element depending on what the class on the HTML element is. So here we have the fresh, be hooking onto that HTML element uh, using the fresh class, and then if it's counting, we'd have different styles, and then and if it's done, we'd have different styles for that as well. So that's a, a nice little design pattern you might want to look into, and then with all of these states, we would have we could have uh, different transitions or animations defined and mixed in there, so that uh, we can have all of our animations uh, taking place in our CSS and we keep it out of our JavaScript, which should basically be responsible for the logic only. So this idea of keeping things modular in our CSS and keeping the CSS out of the JavaScript is demonstrated well with this uh, CSS library by Dan Eden. So he wrote this library called animate.css. He calls it just add water CSS animation. And that's basically what it is. He lets you either download the whole library or as you can see that button there on the left side that says create custom build or you can just download the animations you want. So he has examples of different animations and you can pick whatever, whichever ones you want and you can see on his documentation just exactly how simple it is to use these animations. You just grab an element, add a class of animated, tell it also which animation specifically you want and you can also expand it or extend it a little bit by changing the duration, the delay, and how many times you want the animation to run uh, right there in your CSS. So very simple, use your JavaScript for logic adding and removing the animations and then uh, the CSS actually does the animations or the effects themselves. So you have the option to use these types of existing tools or libraries or you can build your own reusable modules and use them uh, inside your applications. So the benefits here are that the code is modular and it's I think uh, much easier to maintain when you keep your CSS out of your JavaScript like that. So if we're going to be using transitions and animations more often, then it's good to kind of learn uh, the subtleties, uh, kind of the science behind uh, animations and transitions in CSS. So let's focus a little bit on transitions. And again, like I mentioned, a lot of this stuff is probably not new to a lot of the people who have been following my blog or similar blogs online. So let's look at how CSS3 transitions are triggered. So here's a simple transition where we're changing a background color on an element from blue to pink based on a hover event that's occurring on the page. So what is it exactly that triggers this? So you might say, well, it's the hover, the act of hovering. So yes, that's true. But you see there's an inter interesting way that the specification explains how the different transition properties are used. It says these properties are used to animate smoothly from the old state to the new state over time. And so that kind of goes back to what we were just talking about with application states. So it, this kind of is basically saying that when the event occurs, this causes a state change on the page. So the hover event, that was one example of how you can have a state change. So then the state change is actually what causes or triggers the transition. So what are the different ways that state can change on a web page? Well, there are a lot of different ways. We, we showed you already changing classes uh, using JavaScript. You can That basically changes state. But you can also change state just with CSS. Hover state, which we just showed you. The active state, which is the act of clicking down on an element. So during the time that the element is being clicked, that's considered that the element is in this active state. And then you have uh, when an element gets keyboard focus, that can state, change state. Form elements can be checked or disabled. That represents state as well. And also media queries um, represent state changes. So I wrote about this in an article called 
CSS3 transitions without using hover where I talked about all the different ways you can trigger transitions um, with, with CSS without using the hover class, hover pseudo class. So another good thing to know about transitions is, again, this is pretty simple stuff for most experienced developers, uh, CSS developers, uh, is the fact that transitions can have different, uh, or elements can have different transitions for on versus off, or mouse over and mouse out. So notice the difference here between these two uh, transition defined on the same element. So one is defined on the box element and the other is defined on the box element in the hover state. So the one on the hover state might represent what you could call the mouse over state. When the user is mousing over, the background color would change to pink over a period of three seconds, ease in, but then when they mouse out, then it would change back to blue over a period of only one second uh, using the ease out. Trend, uh, timing function. So some people find this intuitive because they can define different transitions for on and off um, depending on what they're doing. Uh, sometimes in a case like this when you're hovering off something it might be more intuitive or better for the interface if it transitions off with only one second so that way it's not uh, wasting any time. So let's look at some more transition subtleties learning more about how these work. So there's a good article by Alex McCaw on CSS transitions. I highly recommend you check that out. He discusses all the kind of ins and outs of transitions and he discusses something interesting here with regards to performance of transitions when for example doing something simple like changing the width of a search box. So he recommends here when transitioning between the two states uh, of in this case it would be the focus state, instead of using width to change the, the element, using Translate 3D instead where you're actually moving the element and then you're clipping it. So it looks like it's getting smaller or bigger, but it's actually not. It's actually moving instead. So if you're going to do something like that, um, it's good to know how, what the difference is between, say, using width and height changes compared to a Translate 3D. Uh, transform where you're where you're actually moving the element or maybe even changing the the scale of the element. So let's say we have a grid of floated boxes on our page. So all of the all of these elements are floated left, and they have margins applied to them to kind of space them out a little bit. So let, if we wanted to change the width and height of that first element, what would happen? Well, from our experience with CSS, we know that this would cause the other elements on the page to move around or reflow. So that element, the width with the width and height change, still has layout, uh, you could say, or it's still uh, causing reflow on the page. But what if we do the same thing with a scale transform? Well, besides the fact that it will actually get bigger from the center, this will not cause the other elements on the page to reflow. And as you'll see, as you can see from the demonstration right there on the page on the slide, the element actually also creates a new stacking context. So instead of being under the other elements in uh, on the in Z index, it actually comes above all the other elements, or it gets on top of the stack, so to speak. So this is a concept that I talked about on in this article called CSS Things That Don't Occupy Space. And I talked about a lot of different things that don't cause reflow or that kind of taken out of the flow of the page. So simple things like text shadows, box shadows, uh, an element that has display none isn't in the flow, obviously, because it's not there. Um, absolutely positioned elements, which include position absolute and position fixed, are also out of the flow. They don't cause other elements around them to move around. And I should point out that these elements are really bad for scrolling performance uh, or, or repaints on scrolling. So when you're using absolutely positioned elements, position fixed and position absolute, that can cause uh, blinking and whatnot when you're scrolling the page. So that's been an issue with those. So you might want to keep that in mind if you're going to be using those. Uh, 
and also position relative offset. So this is a little bit more of a tricky one, maybe one that we don't use as often, but these also don't cause reflow on the page. So if we go back to our floated boxes example, if we were to position this first element relatively and then offset it, the original space it takes up would still be honored. So the elements would all around it would all kind of stay where they are, but then when you offset it to the right and left, or, or from the top and left, uh, 50 pixels say for example, it wouldn't cause the other elements to reflow again. So there's a difference there. And also there's a difference between display none and visibility hidden uh, with regards to reflow. Visibility hidden will keep its uh, original space that it occupies, but display none course will not. So again, most experienced CSS developers understand that. So the other things that I mentioned in that article that are out of the flow are outlines. That's why developer tools use outlines to uh, highlight elements on the page without causing reflow. Transform offsets as well, which we saw. That was the first example that I showed you. Uh, in that case, I was scaling. So whatever you do, scale, skew, rotate, translate, uh, that will not cause things to kind of move around. They won't bump up against other items. It'll just basically expand as if the other elements around aren't even there. So basically this means uh, if you're going to be using CSS more, uh, you know your tools and so you'll be able to use them effectively. And so the last thing that I'll mention here is uh, we've all heard the expression content is king, but I think from a developer's perspective we should coin the term performance is king. So the few resources that I highly recommend you check out because all the stuff that I mentioned here uh, could have performance implications especially if you're using animations and transitions and there's some good resources you can check out as to how you can get smoother transitions and animations especially if you're doing really complex things. So there's a website called jankfree.com and they link to a video called Jankbusters by some Google employees which talks about removing jank from your from your animations, some of your pages on scrolling or when you're animating. And uh, you can also check out the slides for that as well. And actually that, that idea of jank was talked about uh, at one of the keynote uh, talks at jQuery TO uh, by Adi Osmani where he had a talk called uh, Gone in 60 frames per second. I believe that was the name of his talk. And he talked about this idea of getting jank out of your pages. And the other video you, and slides you can check out are this one by Arya Hidayat, and that was a couple weeks ago at W3Conf, which you, you may have caught online. They broadcast the whole thing online, and now that all the uh, talks are available on YouTube. So check out this one. It was a good talk called Fluid User Interface with Hardware Acceleration. So he made a good point where he said that why is it that uh, a really complex animated game like Angry Birds can appear so smoothly on a little tiny device, handheld device, but then when you try and do a similar animation on a web page, you don't get that same smoothness. So he's saying you can take advantage of your of the device's uh, capabilities by uh, taking advantage of hardware acceleration and really getting those fluid interfaces. So I highly recommend you check uh, those out. So all of the links uh, will be posted here on this page, but I had provided a link for everybody at the conference to check out all the links initially. So that's it. Um, I know a lot of the stuff was pretty straightforward for most who have been following me online and stuff, So, but I hope I, you uh, got something out of this. So thanks for watching.